Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. What's going on in the world from a geopolitical military standpoint is obviously uh, something that we're far more aware of today than we were, um, you know, before October the 7th or before the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, a gentleman I've had the privilege of meeting and listening to uh, before and all of us uh, know is uh, is General Rick Hillier. He is the the former retired a Canadian Forces General who served as the Chief of the Defense Staff uh, uh, from 2005 to 2008. Uh, and before that, uh, he was Chief of the Land Staff. And before that, he had every job that you can imagine. Because I understand you actually joined the military when you were 16 years old. So you've been in the military a heck of a long time, sir. Ryan, I, I joined the military when I was eight years old, at least figuratively. <laughs> That's all I wanted to be. So I considered myself a soldier from there on uh, outwards. And uh, Hey, when you say that, like you had every other job, it sounds like I could not hold down a job there. I don't know. That's, no, that's you just kept on uh, climbing the ladder um, and being promoted. Uh, and so it's a privilege to have you, sir. Um, Thank you, I Brian. Glad that to you, be here. Glad to participate. I noticed you made a comment that I that resonated with me and I thought is sort of a wake-up call uh, to, uh, to all of us. Um, and you said that Canada today is irrelevant on the international stage. Did you mean it? And what did you mean by it? Well, uh, first of all, yes, I meant it. Uh, secondly, I did say it. Mercedes Stevenson asked me a question in uh, the West Block, and she asked, what was the greatest threat that I saw to Canada? And I said, our irrelevance on the inter- in the world, our irrelevance on the international state, our irrelevance in NATO. In fact, our irrelevance in the United Nations. And I'll tell you this, uh, I actually made that comment or similar comment about four Four years ago, I was giving a a talk uh, to what were largely conservatives, but it was just a it was a talk uh, and and about Canada, its place in the world, defense and security. And I said Canada is becoming recognized throughout the world as a nation who cannot do anything internationally or domestically. We can't run airports, we can't run passport offices. We 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 have been become very divisive. Uh, within the country, from one region to another, from one strata of society to another, that's not good in any respect. And we have become incapable, it seems, of doing things significantly around the world. You know, it took us so long to do the Mali operation. I never could figure out why we were there, where our national interests were in Mali. But we said we're going to do it. And then it took years to actually get get to the point where we executed it. Uh, we cannot meet our NATO commitments. And we can't meet them now. And our ability to meet them will actually deteriorate as we go forward here to the point where our NATO allies are not calling on us anymore except to call us out. And we heard the UN ambassador and we heard uh, several others, uh, th- sorry, the United States ambassador uh, and, and and others uh, call us out and say, hey, we expect more from Canada. Uh, you've got to live up to your commitments and we're not doing that. So I think now what happens is the world and how it is, the international scenario gets decided by others. And that's so That's so incredibly important to Canada because we live within that structured world, that law and order world, and we're going to have no say in it. Defense and security wise, we're not being asked. Our foreign affairs side, we're not being asked. Our aid side, we're not being asked. And that makes us irrelevant. And so the world will be sorted out one way or the other, good or bad, somewhere in between, most likely, without the benefit of Canada being engaged. So, you know, I'd like to peel back the onion and go through several of these issues if uh, if we could. Uh, you know, one of the challenges is we just don't have enough people in the Canadian military today. Is that because we're not funding it or because people don't want to join the military or both? Well, I think they are funding actually the people part of it. Uh, I And I'm not into the detail of the Department of National Defense budget, but I actually think the funding is there for the ceiling of what is it, 69,000 regular force men and women and and some 28,000 reservists, so a total of about 100,000. The funding is there for it, and, and there, I think there are two main issues right now with the people side of it. One is the inability to recruit, particularly into the regular force, uh, and, and that seems to have struck just a dry hole right now, and, and people are not flocking to join for many reasons, I'm certain. And the second part that's equally important, and sometimes even more so, is the ability to retain people who are already there. And, you know, I've had the opportunity in recent weeks to meet with a variety of folks during during some business and, and just during my travel, et cetera. And, and they're younger people who are not yet retirable. They're not going to get a full pension. 
and yet they leave and they say simply, I've had enough, I, I'm out, and, and, and their morale has been destroyed. So the ability to retain people is equally important to the ability to recruit people. And right now it appears we're having massive challenges with both. What about with uh, with equipment? Uh, you know, we hear it takes us, what, 10, 15 years to decide which jet we're going to uh, buy. Uh, we've got issues with frigates. We've got issues with tanks. We've got issues with it seemingly everything. You know, something uh, like an Air Force commander made the comment some years ago about, you know, one of the greatest tools for recruiting and retention are new aircraft on the flight line. And, and so that is absolutely crucial. You know, and, and I used to say to Minister Gord O'Connor when he and I were looking at infrastructure that was old and tired and worn down and, you know, had been used as horse stables back in 1915 and we had kind of fixed it up and still using it. I say, Minister, we don't attract first class people with third class infrastructure. And so the procurement issue is, is massive. And, and I think in, inside of the Department of National Defense, I think there's a lot of that that burden, that weight has got to be borne by them, that guilt, if you will. I think the bureaucratic process is just absolutely intertwined so thoroughly that getting contracts done for anything is months and months and months, and that and people go around in circles with a process as opposed to being focused on delivering a product. And so when you don't do that, and when everything you're getting, you know, you're saying it's going to be, oh, two years or five years or eight years out, hey, uh, people make decisions on staying in the Canadian forces or joining the Canadian forces today. And, and I think that's really, really challenging. I think the Navy is on a good track, not with the people, but with the equipment side, except I would say to the government of Canada, uh, you want to hammer down what the Navy is doing and what they're spending on that Canadian uh, surface combat surface, the Canadian surface combatant, because the price tag on that and the uncertainty of what we're going to deliver is massive. I mean, that in and, of, in and of itself, I actually think could bankrupt the Canadian forces if we don't get it right. And hopefully we will, but we have to discipline that process. The Air Force is on a good track in the longer term. I worry most about the Army. The Army is lacking, you know, uh, self-propelled uh, artillery, uh, air defense systems, counter UAS. It's lacking tanks that work. It's lacking ammunition to train. And all of those things affect whether people want to join the army or want to stay. And in this case, many are not joining and many are leaving. And that's killing the uh, killing the, the ability of the land forces to do any mission whatsoever. Everything is a cobble together of units from the people who are there. And that gets very, very difficult. Yeah, people are the number one issue, but everything relates to it. Everything relates to it. I spoke to a, an expert on uh, Arctic sovereignty and... Uh... And his comment was that uh, we couldn't uh, dream of defending ourselves in the Arctic if anything happened, and uh, and that Russia and China are uh, potentially thinking about, if not doing something. And he said, worse, we wouldn't even know it if it happened. And and I guess that comes back to, and I, I tend to agree with that. In fact, I do agree with that. And that comes back to my point about irrelevance. Unless we're a strong member and standing in NATO, and unless we're really tied into the United States of America, and unless we really are tied into that Five Eyes community, uh, if something happens across the North, and frankly, I'm just surprised that Putin hasn't done something yet to distract from what's happening in Ukraine and to get the NATO and the Americans all focused in that North part. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. But if something does happen, uh, we are going to be completely at the wishes and whims of our friends and allies or those who we formerly considered friends and allies and, and because we can't do it by ourselves here. And thus, you've got to be relevant. You've got to be credible in an organization. If, if they're going to be ready to come and support Canada in that perimeter, we've got to be prepared to be part of the greater NATO mission, for example, the greater U.S. mission. And, and right now, we're not deemed as being that. We're going to have a wide-ranging conversation with uh, former General uh, Rick Hillier uh, tonight. We're going to talk about Ukraine. We're going to talk about NATO. We're going to talk about uh, refugees, immigration. We're going to talk about uh, defense budgets. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. We're going to take a break, first of all, uh, for some messages and be back with uh, General Rick Hillier in two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumbie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm really honored to be chatting tonight with uh, General Rick Hillier. Uh, he uh, was the former chief of the defense staff uh, in the 
uh, 2005 to 2008 time period. Uh, he was the chief of land staff uh, before that, uh, and he's been in uh, the military for quite a long time. He uh, uh, attended Royal Military College of Canada. Um, sorry, no, you didn't. You uh, were rejected. No, I did not, Brian. I attended were... Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador, the and... best university in our great nation. Excellent. And uh, and then you studied biology, I understand. I did. Fantastic. Uh, but then you became a officer cadet uh, and uh, studied in Newfoundland as the regular officer training program. Yeah, that's what I, I was in the regular officer training program, ROTP, at Memorial University. And as soon as I finished that in December of 1975, uh, started, if you will, full-time training, full-time employment and training from there on in. And I understand you were in charge of uh, some of the recovery operations after that big ice storm in Ontario. And then you were ahead of uh, our command in uh, Bosnia, Persugova. Yeah, I, I had a great fortune to command. Uh, I was in, in Croatia, Bosnia, and, and the area around that, including Kosovo and Macedonia, for a significant amount of time over my over the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, there as a staff officer with the United Nations, I was there as the deputy brigade commander uh, for Canada when S4, the NATO uh, takeover, took place in, in Bosnia. And then I went back as division commander in Bosnia, commanding a division of Canadian uh, British, uh, Dutch, and Czech troops, plus a, plus a variety of other supporting nations, uh, for sure. And that was a pretty incredible year there. That year ended uh, with a nexus that changed our security environment, which was 9-11, of course. Uh, that's when I ended that, that command and came home. And then a little while later, I got to go to Texas, be the deputy commander of the U.S. 3rd Armored Corps, uh, the Phantom Warriors in Fort Hood, Texas. That was an incredible two years for me and, and my family, certainly. And then I came back and, and uh, after a little while, after being chief of land staff for a very short period of time, sadly, because that was most uh, enjoyable and rewarding and, and exactly what I wanted to do as a leader, uh, I got asked by the minister and the chief of defense staff to go to Afghanistan and command the NATO mission there, uh, ISAF. And so I did that and then came back and wandered around and finally fell into the appointment of chief of defense staff. So, you know, with your experience and, and particularly your experience in Bosnia, then in Afghanistan, I've got to ask you about what's going on in Ukraine uh, right now uh, and the role or lack thereof of Canada. Uh, I, I spoke uh, just this week with uh, someone from Kiev who uh, who repeated the lines that uh, you know often hear that, uh, you know, peace comes through strength uh, and that uh, the smartest thing we could do right now from a, a Western standpoint is... Uh, is arm Ukraine, defeat Putin, discourage uh, this kind of aggression uh, in the future. What do you think about, number one, what NATO is doing in regards to Ukraine, and number two, what Canada's role in that is? Well, uh, first of all, I, I would say say this, is that Ukraine is asking for no soldiers to go there and fight, to fight those Russians, to bleed and die. And what they're saying is our soldiers will fight, our nation will fight. We need your material assistance. We need your financial assistance and we need your sanctions on Russia to diminish Russia's capability to continue this war and kill our population, men, women and children, which they are doing on a daily basis. I would not be too harsh on Canada for its support to Ukraine. Canada has done a lot and I'll give, I'll give our country, I'll give our government full credit for doing exactly that. But here's what I would say. Do everything you can and then do some more. Uh, what we have not had in across Canada, across really many of the, the countries in the Western world that Ukraine depends upon for that support, is somebody to tell the story of why. Yes, President Zelensky is a very magnetizing figure. He's eloquent in the extreme. However, he can only do so much. And we have not had people, we have not had our own politicians, quite frankly, our own political leaders tell the Canadians why we should spend a significant part of our taxpayer dollars to help a country that's so far away involved in a fight for for its life. And, you know, I saw a cartoon the other day. It was a, a massive torrent of water being held back by a big dam. And, and the torrent of water ready to rage was Russia. The dam was Ukraine. And the part on the other side of the dam, the lower terrain where that water would go if the dam broke, was Western Europe and the Western world. And I thought, it sums it up, you know. Can you imagine? It's tough. It's expensive now supporting Ukraine to old Russia in those eastern oblasts to keep Russia from taking over the country. Think how much more expensive. Think of what a greater change and what chaos it would bring if Russia broke out there 
and all of a sudden, Russia's army with Putin in command was standing on the borders of Slovakia and Poland and Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania. All of those countries believe that if that occurred, Russia's next step would be into them, and none of them have a whole lot of faith that NATO would be there to assist them if that occurred. And can you think of the chaos that would, would occur, the impact on the economy worldwide, the impact on energy prices, the impact on infl inflation and a variety of other things? And so I would simply say every dollar we spend to help Ukraine uh, keep Russia away is a dollar in support of law and order, that international order that we depend on in Canada for our our interests and our standards of living and all of those things that we owe near and dear to our heart. Canada has done a lot. I would say you've done a lot, do more. And then when you think you've done everything you can do yet more because Ukraine desperately needs it right now. You know, your your point about the lack of uh, of a leader making the the point um, and, 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 and convincing people of how important it is, is really interesting. Uh, you've undoubtedly, uh, you know, heard Nikki Haley, who is one of the candidates uh, for the Republican uh, nomination uh, for president. She's been saying, and she's been criticizing both uh, the democratic party, Joe Biden, the president, uh, as well as the balance of the Republican party saying no one is making the case for why funding Ukraine is so important. And she's argued comparable to what you said is that, uh, you know, if we don't fund Ukraine, then in the future, it is going to be American soldiers that are going to have to be fighting. And it's far better to uh, to 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 arm and fund uh, Ukraine in this fight uh, to hold uh, Putin where he is, if not to uh, bring him back to the original borders. Um, and that if he wins, we are teaching him that uh, that you can attack uh, Moldova, the Baltics, uh, etc. Um I understand, and I spoke with uh, an expert uh, in Ukraine this week that said that uh, you know Russia is on three shifts in all of their munitions factories and their armaments and their artillery, et cetera, and they're and they're that they're they're at a war level of manufacturing, and that we're doing next to nothing in the West. Uh, we're you know lazily working one shift and 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 supplying them when we can. What do you think of that criticism? Well, I, I would I would go back to the first point you made, though, about Nikki Haley's comments about saying, hey, if we don't support Ukraine, we're telling Putin it's OK and keep going and you can end up with Moldova and, and the other countries as you wish. But just think also what we're telling countries like China and North Korea and Iran uh, that, you know, hey, the U.S. is not going to be there. The West is not going to be there. They don't have the stomach to hang in there for this longer, tougher fight. And so now we'll start taking liberties and doing what we wish on our own timeline based on how we see things unfolding without a great worry that the West is going to be there and, and you know, put in that dam to hold us back. And, and so I think it would be horrible uh, for the world, for the international order. I mean, I, I would think that China would be emboldened to accelerate the timeline where they think they can take Taiwan back and wrap it into the greater China. I think North Korea would really start looking seriously at what it could do in South Korea. That in itself is absolutely frightening. And Iran tries something like this every single day. So I, I think it's absolutely fundamentally important that we help Ukraine. And, and as I said earlier, hey, this is dollars. This is industrial help. Yeah, I know it's our taxpayer dollars. I pay them also. And, and you've got to articulate why we're doing this, but not doing it brings a far greater cost. Putin has... With his, uh, with his coterie of folks that are around him, he has uh, put Russia on a wartime mobilization in so many ways, particularly with his industry. And yeah, they reached out to North Korea and Iran and, and other nations where they possibly can to find support and supplies, artillery shells or the, the Shahid drone, for example, from Iran. But they've also put their own country into a, a greater industrial output. We in the West have not. The United States has been doing some of that but it's been a slow process for them. We in Canada have not been doing that at all. And I think there's an area where we can really step up and we can step up our, the, the industrial capacity that supports an armed forces, that's right across the entire spectrum of our economy. And do that, make ourselves more ready in the Canadian forces. For example, by producing artillery rounds, we've got an incredible uh, company down in, in Ingersoll, Ontario called IMT. Uh, they could expand their capacity. They could increase their capacity in what they do uh, in, in fairly short order. They need a tiny little bit of investment. But at the same time we're doing that, we're producing rounds that the Canadian Forces desperately needs either to use for training, 
potentially to use for operations and to have in reserve in case, in case of a greater fight. But at the same time, we're also creating jobs, awesome jobs for Canadians. So I, I fail to understand why we at, across the nation have not started investing in that industrial complex that do so much. And whether it's for drones or whether it's for aircraft parts or whether for uh, fighting vehicles and all those other things that we desperately need, I think we need to have a strategic look at it and start with some serious investment in it because it's for our own benefit. It's for the benefit of the 40 million Canadians that call this great nation our home. So our spending is uh, dramatically less than the uh, NATO commitment of the 2% of GDP. Is that something that we should be rectifying? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we've agreed to it with NATO. And, and you know, we've always been viewed by NATO, quite frankly, except for a very short period of time in 2006, 2007, 2008, except for that very short period of time, we've always been viewed as a parasite, honestly. A uh, parasite? NATO. Really? Yeah, parasite? we have been. We have been. And, and you know, uh, everybody sees Canada, hey, we're a G7 nation, you know, we're a founding member of NATO, a founding member of the United Nations. We push the responsibility to protect uh, resolution through the United Nations, and yet we offer no capacity or very little capacity to help enforce that. And so we've not been viewed through a favorable lens from any of the other nations across NATO. And in particular now, as the world change, changes and as that threat grows, and it's very obvious to all, to everybody, we are not changing and the increase is not coming as rapidly as we would want in the Canadian forces. And here's what I would say, and nobody will like this. Our armed forces have been have been so constrained and so damaged over this past years here that 2% will no longer suffice. We will not be able to rebuild the armed forces to give them the capacity and the capability they need. With 2%, we're going to have to go more. You made a comment about, I think it was the five eyes. I'm not sure if everyone understands what that organization is. And you said we're no longer what part of it or being respected by it? No, we're part of it. But, you know, the five eyes are the countries of New Zealand, slightly on the, on the periphery, but still part of it, Australia, the United, United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. And, and so we've always been closer. We've been closer as a, a close group of friends inside a bigger group of friends called NATO or some of the other alliances. And, and we've always shared, we've always sort of participated with each other's activities to learn from each other, to support each other. And particularly, of course, that becomes important on the technological side, on the intelligence sharing side, et cetera. In, uh, in recent years, uh, Canada really has, I, I won't say fallen into disfavor, but we've just been irrelevant. And so, so as a result, what you get is the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia actually coming together in a smaller group and, and if you will, forming their own Three Eyes community, initially focused on submarines, but now it's extending to much, much more. And with that step, Canada starts to get pushed off to the periphery completely and become more relevant. And so that's why I say irrelevance for us is, is, is horrible. It's our biggest threat. When you're pushed like that, you know, the, the intelligence sharing that you get to look at the threats that are coming your way to the things that you should do to counter those threats, you don't start to get the same amount of it. You don't have the same in in the allies to talk about joint actions and, and how you work together. And all of those things start to imp impact your ability, first of all, to, to provide for your own security, but secondly, to help shape the world around you. And that's crucial to us also. You were suggesting and thinking your comments and also earlier in our conversation that our irrelevance was beyond military strength. It was sort of in foreign affairs. Um, is that just because we're not spending enough money or is there something else that's causing us to be irrelevant? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's worthy of an entire conversation and a, and a book and a, and a program and a series on its own, truthfully. I've been disappointed in uh, in recent years with foreign affairs and our ability to be able to put those incredible young men and women that I saw initially on operations around the world with me and, and with Canadian soldiers and aviators and sailors. Uh, we had those incredible indiv individuals. The ambassador to Croatia when I was there, Graham Green, was just a phenomenal get it done guy. All of them felt constrained to the point of suffocation. All of the ones I met felt constrained to the point of suffocation by the bureaucratic process back in the Pearson building in Ottawa. Many of them, particularly the best ones, many of them, as soon as they finished those appointments where they felt they were relevant and doing some good and could actually strike out, you know, and, and based on their abilities and characteristics and the mission that they were given, 
many of them felt they were doing some good stuff. And then they kind of got reined in by that bureaucratic process, that suffocating process. And when their appointments finished, so many of them just left the foreign service. And, and, and now what you see are folks who, who hacked with a lack of initiative, a lack of independence, a lack of, if you will, joie de vivre, to get out there and do things for Canada. And they're suffocated by that bureaucratic process back at the Pearson building in Ottawa. I've seen it. It, it means that our plans to get things done are stifled. It means that there's huge time delay, huge bureaucratic process. And at the end of it, often we don't get things done. The, the, the diplomacy side is a massive lever for Canada, and it's not been a very powerful one in these past years. You know, I, I found it interesting just in the last couple of days uh, with uh, the, the passing of uh, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney that uh, he was credited uh, with playing such a critically important role in uh, the end of the apartheid in South Africa. So at some point in time in the past, you know, we played a very important international role. Why have we lost that? Well, first of all, you know, leaders like Brian Mulroney, and not everybody liked him, obviously, they only come along once in a while. And, you know, he had that statesman approach. He had the ability to establish personal relationships with with people like George uh, George Herbert Bush, the president, President Reagan, obviously, and personal relationships matter. And he did it with a credibility that Canada could hack, Canada could do certain things, and was prepared to do that. And th those personal relationships helped change the world. I mean, obviously, it led to, quite frankly, the Canada U.S. Mexico free trade deal, and, and that changed our nation for the better in almost every single way we can think about. But it gave him an end then to deal with the greater issues around the world, including something as terrible as apartheid in, in South Africa. Uh, we had a statesman. We had somebody who worked both sides of the, uh, both aisles or both sides of the aisle in parliament. And, and you know, uh, I, I remember reading something uh, President Reagan had said, and I think Brian Mulroney also epitomized that was Reagan said, look, I don't, I don't agree necessarily with those guys across the aisle, but I kind of like that. And, and he used that as his methodology and actually worked with him to achieve things. And I think Brian Mulroney did much the same. He was renowned, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, he was renowned, obviously, for his ability to reach out to individuals, to remember them, to establish a personal relationship so that every person felt important, felt consulted, felt engaged, even if he disagreed with them. He was not divisive from that perspective. He was an exceptional statesman and I think an exceptional prime minister and we haven't really seen that uh, since. One of the uh, the recent examples of our lack of uh, impact in, in 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 the world that was relayed to me was Haiti, where I guess uh, we were asked by the Americans <laughs> to play an important role in Haiti, and and we turned it down because I've been told we just felt we didn't have the the capacity to do it. Uh, what, what's your opinion on Haiti? Well, I, I also don't believe that we had the capacity to do it. But also, I would say, I would have, if I were the chief of defense staff still, I would have been advising the prime minister to stay away from it, not to touch it with a 10-foot pole, to, to, to run away and hide, and to do everything we can diplomatically, do everything we can with aid. But 80 is a, is a you know, a beehive of uh, criminal gangs, drug smuggling, corruption, and brutality and poverty. And nobody from outside is going to solve those issues. I remember being there and just going through the area where there's a firefight going on with my little team of security and, and, and walking through that. And there's just, you know, 150 people on each side into full of gun battles. And you say, unless you're going in with a massive military force to knock that down, to put a government in place that can then fill the vacuum, and you can't do that, it's going to have to come from within you're not going to solve the issue. So, yeah, we had a lack of capacity. No question about that, because you got to do so many things if you command an operation like that at that level. But secondly, I would have advised the government of Canada to do exactly what they did, run away from that, because it's going to be never ending and it's going to draw you into a quagmire, which is going to be horrible. That would be my opinion of it. And I, that would have been my military advice to a prime minister. We're chatting tonight with uh, General Rick Hillier, uh, retired uh, general, uh, retired head of uh, the Chief of the Defence uh, Staff uh, about Canada and our place in the world today, uh, or our lack thereof. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with General Hillier. Stay with us, everybody.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is uh, General Rick Hillier, who uh, is retired, but he was uh, in the the 2000 uh, uh, era, uh, the head of the Canadian um, Chief of the Defense Staff. Uh, Before that, he was uh, head of the Land Staff. Before that, he had a uh, an incredible military career in numerous different uh, places around the world and in Canada, um, and uh, played uh, critical roles. Uh, you know, one of the most interesting ones has got to have been commanding the NATO Afghanistan uh, role uh, in uh, 2004. Uh, so you've really done the job um, and uh, done it at uh, the operational level and at the most uh, senior level. And you were also um, renowned, sir, as someone who was very plain spoken. Um, and I think because of that, your your personnel really uh, admired you and uh, and and followed you. Uh, but some of your plain spokenness got you in trouble at times. I understand that once uh, you uh, got criticism from the media when you called terrorists uh, dis- detestable murderers and scumbags. Um, so you're known for calling it like it is. You mentioned that you wanted to talk about our current refugee and immigration system. Well, Brian, look, uh, let me just go back to what I called terrorists. I still believe that. I was talking about people who were killing Canadian boys and girls who were there to help a nation achieve some kind of stability and and grow into something much, much, much better than what they had come from. I was talking about people who murdered young kids, who murdered uh, moms and dads and cared not about it as long as they could destroy something and and, and try and keep enough anarchy that they would have a chance to take over that country. And sadly... Uh, they have done that. And I, I I have the same feeling. I'd use the same description right now. When we talk about refugees, I, I, I said earlier on that about four years ago at a speech for the Manning Institute, and I was doing it in Ottawa, I postulated that Canada was being seen around the world as a nation that it could accomplish nothing, domestically or internationally. We've talked a lot about what we're not doing internationally. And and frankly, we are doing some things well in that Latvia battalion. I know it's a strain and a stress and an effort, but that, that's a good thing to be doing, and we need to build up on that. But inside of our country, we have to do things important to Canadians too. And I just walk around the cities of Canada, whether it's Toronto or Ottawa or, or my goodness, Halifax or even St. John's, Newfoundland, or I have not been out west in the last little while, but it's the same out there, I know. And I see nothing but one tenth encampment of another with tarpaulins all over the place and hundreds and thousands and thousands of people who are immigrants who are refugees, who are seeking political asylum. And I say, we can do better. We're reducing our country piecemeal to chaos by having this occur. And how come we're not stepping up? And oh, by the way, as we step up to help them and therefore help Canada, keep Canada from being reduced to a more chaotic situation, we could be helping Ukraine by looking after their their men and women who are fleeing that horrible, destructive war. You know, uh, foreign affairs were saying that up to 70 to 80,000 Ukrainians who have visas issued to them, which expire the end of March, might be making their way to Canada now before those visas expire. Can you imagine what would occur? Uh, look, there are there are three three pieces to the housing. Number one is the traditional homeless, horrible, terrible, and it's expanding. But we have, if you will, a system, a structure in place with shelters and, and support to do that in the cities across our nation. And yeah, uh, it, that population is expanding, and though and and it's bursting at the seams and. We've rented all the hotel rooms that we can afford to rent for them, and and the shelters are bursting. And then on the other end, there's the permanent housing crisis. And what was it? CIBC said we need 8.5 million new homes in Canada, and, and man, that's a that's a challenge right there. But in between, we've got those tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of refugees coming in. There are solutions to this, and and we need to be looking at them. I'm just worried that we are not. Whether that's a modular housing uh, solution where you bring in and find a you know, a flat piece of ground of five to 10 acres and, you know, 100 people per acre, put them in those trailers, which look like 18 wheeler trailers and, and are very comfortable inside with bunks or beds with another trailer. That's their kitchen trailer to feed them and another trailer that's ablutions, as we called it in the military or showers and, and toilets for them. And those kind of solutions are available and they're available with a very quick flash to bang time but we're not availing ourselves of them right now. And and to me, I think we can do a lot better because I walk around and, you know, you get a chance to meet one or two of those people. And it's a young Ukrainian couple living in a tent on the sidewalk in downtown Toronto. They came here, the, the, the homeless shelters were filled. 
They have no money. They acquired a tent somehow. In the middle of winter, they're living there. There's a couple next to them from Mexico with a little baby living in a tent in February and January in Toronto. You say, we can do better. We cannot let our, our cities and our provinces and our nation deteriorate to this kind of chaos. Let's step up and do better. For that middle ground, we can find some solutions. And it's not going to be cheap. But compared to the cost of letting our country become, if you will, a third world derelict bunch of cities and provinces and towns, and we don't want that, the cost is insignificant. There are solutions available. We need a national strategy. We had that when we brought in 50,000 Syrians, what was it, eight, nine years ago. This government, in fact, the federal government did it. We had a national strategy. John McCallum was the Minister of Immigration and Citizenship. He brought in a guy, Bernie DeReeb, to run that for him. It was immensely successful. The Governor General, David Johnson, hosted a national seminar at Rideau Wall. He was kind enough to, to invite me because I was mouthing off about, we should do this right. We had mayors and, and provinces uh, represented there. I remember Mayor Mike Savage from Halifax standing up and talking about what Halifax would do to meet the challenge, supported by the province and supported by the feds. And we did it beautifully. Now we have 50,000 Syrian Canadians who are simply part of the fabric of this great nation. And we don't even notice it anymore. We need to do the same uh, with the refugees and the, those folks seeking political asylum that are coming in now in their thousands every week. And we can do it. There are solutions available. We just need to get at it and avail ourselves of those solutions. We seem to have actually... Uh figured things out during the pandemic and uh and and rolled uh you know our solutions out reasonably quickly and you were head of the vaccination task force for a while some people have said we need that kind of effort again in in housing uh do you agree uh, in fact i do uh that's really what john mccallum did uh back in 2015 with bernie de Reeve and, and and just really took it away from the public service of canada quite frankly and and, and did it that way and just put in somebody to make this happen. And you've got carte blanche, you can deal with provinces, deal with cities, deal with unions, deal with the First Nations. And that's exactly what occurred. And we, we need that kind of effort right now, that kind of leadership. And we need it across the nation to deal with the provinces who are dealing with the municipalities who are, who are sort of falling under the weight of this incredible burden. And like I say, this is for Canada. This is not us spending money for Ukrainian refugees. This is for Canada. We cannot let our, if we're inviting those folks here because they're running away from this disaster, this tragedy, we cannot just let our, our, our cities and our provinces sort of, you know, break underneath the strain of looking after them. I had a gentleman on my show last week, David McLaughlin is his name. He was the C, he is the CEO of an organization called the Institute on Governance. He was the former chief of staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. He was the head of the public service in, uh, in Manitoba during uh, uh, covid and his argument is that the civil service has so much bureaucracy and red tape, it's not capable of doing this. And he was recommending the appointment of a chief operating officer for each of the major uh, agencies of uh, parliament and often brought from the private sector uh, uh, so that you know you have some change agent uh, in government that can shake it up and get things done. He said that uh, the current system just can't get things done um, because of bureaucracy and red tape. What would you say to him, sir? I'd agree with him that the current system just can't get things done. Uh, what I see, uh, what I see is that process in the public service has become the product. And it's not the fact that you can get a contract signed and deliver an air defense system, for example, for Ukraine. It's the fact that you just go around and around and you never get a contract signed because you're just going through the steps of the process. Somebody asks one more question, you go back and redo the steps. And then two years later, you'll still be out there with no contract signed process becomes the product. And most civil servants are frustrated by that. They'd like to achieve certain things also. But I do think there needs to be some dramatic changes. And, and let me just tell you one thing. Smaller is better. Smaller is better. The bigger you get, the more the process, the more cumbersome it becomes, the longer it takes to do things, and the less things you get done overall. Smaller is better in the public service. I fundamentally agree with it. We also need to step back and, and, and I, I dislike one of the things in particular that's occurred across our nation, where we have made industry and the private sector a bad thing. And, and it's almost like it's an evil thing. And really, that's what keeps our nation going. But the ability of the public service to deal with the private sector, you know, there's been a wedge driven down so deeply that people are afraid to talk to companies, afraid to talk to industry. 
afraid to talk to CEOs and, and men and women who can drive things for them. I think we have to, to, to knit that part back together again. And I saw it firsthand during the vaccine rollout. I mean, that was a challenging time. And it's kind of interesting now to look at, you know, the millions of vaccines and nobody wants them. And, and, and back then we had, you know, thousands of vaccines and, you know, millions who wanted them. And so the stress was huge there. And, and now it's just completely, completely changed. Uh, I do think we need a change in the public service. And that change has got to be operationally focused to produce for the citizens that they represent, that they serve, what those citizens need. Sir, you've been chief of the defense staff. You've uh, you know, served our country around the world. You've got more decorations uh, than anyone I know. Uh, Order of Canada, Order of Military Merit, Order of St. John, Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, it goes on and on and on. You're retired now. Why are you still so passionate and making comments on what do you think is wrong with Canada and what we need to do? Well, first of all, I'm not quite retired. <laughs> I, failed that, uh, I failed that part of my life, so I'm not quite retired. I do a lot. Uh, I support a lot of our uh, nonprofits and charities across Canada that support, in particular, in particular, our veterans, our men and women in uniform and their families. Uh, and I love doing that. I, I'm engaged because I'm a Canadian. I'm proud. I'm a proud Canadian. I love our nation. I loved I love serving it. I Nothing I love more than getting up in the morning for all those years and putting on my uniform with that beautiful flag on my left shoulder. Nothing I love more than seeing that aircraft you know, land on a mission area and, and, and have that big Canadian flag on, on the tail boom. And, and it just made me feel proud every moment. I love our nation. I think we are, we are a great nation. We have lost some of our edge and I think we need to get it back. And there's not, there are not that many people talking about it. I am distressed by the political situation in our country, which is so divisive. Uh, the political situation is just an abyss. You mentioned any single subject out of 10,000 and everybody will line up on one side or the other instantly and scream at each other. And there is no debate. There is no across the aisles approach like Brian Mulroney brought. And, and that part does distress me greatly. Not enough Canadians are speaking out about those things. And I have my opinions and my views forged in, you know, from a certain angle, from a certain point of view. And I just want to articulate those, let people debate those or disagree with them. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I just want to get the debate going that Canada needs to do certain things to ensure that we are the great nation that we all know and love and call home and are proud to live in and proud to work in and a proud place to raise our families. And that's why I do it. We're going to take a break for some final uh, messages and come back with some concluding comments with uh, General Rick Hillier, uh, former head of the, the defense staff in just two minutes. And I'm going to ask him about leadership because he's been a unique leader in uh, in Canadian history. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. A uh, real honor for me to be chatting tonight with uh, General Rick Hillier. He is uh, the former uh, head of the chief of the defense staff uh, and had a long military uh, career uh, before that uh, and now very involved in uh, charitable um, activities and uh, and other activities, uh, speaking, etc. And and sir, I've seen you uh, back in uh, the early two thousands address uh, um, you know military personnel as uh, chief of the defense staff. I've seen you address a couple of political uh, organizations um, just as a as a as a citizen. And you are a captivating speaker, but you're also a very plain spoken uh, speaker and uh, and someone that people. Uh, and military people I've seen really respect. You, I understand, uh, have a speech that you talk about in regards to leadership in tough times. And you've been in some tough places and some tough times and had some tough assignments in Afghanistan and, and rolling out vaccines. Tell me, what do you think the secret is to being a great leader in tough times? Well, I don't think there are any secrets. I think it's pretty obvious. Number one, uh, I believe this fundamentally I still try to live it in whatever little way I can, and, and I would commend it to any uh, person. Uh, number one, it's all about people. Uh, it's all about people. If you focus on the people that look to you for leadership uh, and you ensure that they're prepared to do 
uh, what it is you need them to do or prepare to execute your great mission, that they have taken that great mission and made it their own mission and that they have everything they need. And whether that's a piece of equipment, a cell phone or a fighter jet, make sure they're equipped to do it. Make sure they're trained and confident going in. Make sure they know that they've got your backing as the leader and that when things go wrong as they will, you're there with them to help them learn from that and get better going out. You don't blame people. You accept responsibility yourself. And when things go right, you're there to give them credit, not steal it for yourself and rush to the podium and say, hey, look how great I am. Look at my trophy. You give them the credit. We used to have a saying in the Army that victory has a thousand uh, fathers and defeat is an orphan. And I would urge leaders to turn that on its head. You know, when things are going well, you give credit to the people who make that happen. And when things go badly, you help uh, rescue the situation, help people learn from what has gone on and what happened and how and help them get better and make the organization better. And if things go right, hey, you'll get lots of credit. So you don't need to rush out and grab it for yourself. It's all about people. Number two is uh, actions talk and bullshit walks. Uh, you know, actions speak loudly. Uh, look people in the eye. Uh, when you say to them, you're going to do something, you make sure you do it. And you make sure that it gets done in the way that you want to do it. All your words are the side. You can talk endlessly. You can talk forever. And if you don't do things, you're going to just be seen as, as this useless individual who is wasting their time. And your credibility will disappear overall. Number three, values are important. You, you simply can't be one way at home and one way at work, if you will, in your profession. Values are important. Loyalty to the people who work with you, uh, who, who report to you, who look to you for leadership, loyalty upwards to our nation in our case. And, and you have to define that very carefully because that's not necessarily to a government or a, or a minister or a prime minister. You have to define that very carefully. But values are important. Loyalty, integrity, uh, and, you know, and, and, and those kinds of values which we believed in fundamentally. And I'll just give you an example as soldiers how, how this occurred. Uh, you know, how loyalty and integrity, for example, actually played out. Loyalty, you went into a, a compound in Afghanistan or somewhere else, and you're the first rifleman or, right, or, or infantry soldier going through that door. Somebody inside may be waiting to kill you. You never once had to look over your shoulder to ensure that the rest of that section was coming behind you. They were so loyal to you, and you would have been to them if you were positions reversed, that you went through that door and you knew that number two, uh, soldier number three were right behind you. You were not going to be alone. And then we had such integrity that if you went into that room or that compound and you were intent on doing something that is unethical, that we would not accept, everybody else in that section had enough moral courage that they would hold you accountable and stop you from doing that. We had loyalty and integrity. Values are absolutely important. And there are all kinds of things I could say, but I always would end by saying, look, if you forget all the other rules, just go back to number one. It's all about people. Uh, how you succeed in a mission, how your team is going to do is all going to be dependent upon the people in that and whether they execute the mission. You set them up. You be the servant leader to make them successful and you're going to be okay. It's all about the people. Give them the equipment that they need, support them and uh, value. Sounds like a it's a great recipe, sir. I really appreciate it. You know, we've had a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. And we've hardly talked about, you know, the actual military uh, stuff of what's going on around the world today. And I'd love to, to to chat with you for another hour on that if you ever got some time to talk about that. Let me ask you one question, though, in that regard. In regards to Ukraine right now, do you think they're going to be able to turn it around? Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? I, I, I'm neither right now. Uh, Ukraine cannot turn it around without the support, material, financial, the sanctions against Russia that I mentioned earlier. They cannot turn it around without that support. And, you know, I'm troubled by what happens in Hungary and I'm troubled, troubled by what's happening in the United States of America with the Republicans in, in Congress. I mean, they, they, they will do what they decide. Uh, I, I just see it in an entirely different manner, in an entirely different way. Ukraine desperately needs that support to keep Russia at bay. The cost compared to what it would be if Russia wins is minuscule. And, and so that support has to come. I don't see it happening right now. And that's what the concern is. Ukraine will provide the troops. And yeah, they've still got more work to do. 
the nation is not 100% mobilized. And, and that's a tough, tough thing to do with a nation of 40 people. But they are making incredible strides for domestic production, uh, bringing up more and more soldiers, developing the territorial defense force, almost like a militia, into a very capable fighting force. Uh, they'll do their part, though. And they're taking enormous losses of, of you know, blood, flesh and blood uh, uh, every single day. They cannot win the fight. They cannot win the fight without the support from the West. With that support, anything is possible. And then I would be immensely optimistic that Ukraine could actually break out and take those Eastern Oblasts back. They would make it so expensive for Russia to continue attacking that something would have to give inside of Russia. They could isolate Crimea until eventually Russian forces have to leave completely. And they could hold uh, the Black Sea as their pawn, not Russia's. Ukraine cannot do it without the support from the West. General Rick Hillier, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Brian, my pleasure. Thank you. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and videos are put up on social media, on YouTube, as soon as uh, the, the radio show is broadcast, and on my website, briancrombie.com. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Mr. Hillier, General Hillier.